Good afternoon and uh, welcome everyone to today's lecture by uh, Dr. Nadine Elenani titled Bordering Britain, Law, Race and Empire. Um, today's event is the first in the series of talks hosted this autumn term by the Center for Advanced International Theory, short Kate here at the University of Sussex. Um, my name is Melanie richter morputi I'm the director of Kate and I'm speaking from the off here because um, we're unable to uh, turn on my video function right now. Um, I would like to thank the Department of International Relations for co-sponsoring the event. And my special thank you goes to my colleague Sophie Herford, who's done much of the work in getting us together this afternoon and for the first time for us here at Kate remotely via Zoom webinar. Um, a few words of housekeeping. This event will be recorded and published online, including on YouTube. Dr. Elenani will speak for around 30 minutes, and then we have a good 45 minutes for questions and conversation. I'm now going to introduce today's speaker. We are absolutely delighted to kick off our academic year with Dr. Nadine Elenani, who will present research from her new book published by Manchester University Press. Dr. Elenani teaches at Birkbeck School of Law and co-directs the Center for Research on Race and Law. Dr. Elenani researches in the fields of migration and refugee law, European Union law, protest and criminal justice. She's currently conducting a Leverhulme Trust funded project that focuses on questions of race and criminal and social justice in death in custody cases. Nadine, over to you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Melanie, and to Kate, um, to Sophie for all the organizing, and to the Department of International Relations for inviting me, um, and um, to all of you for coming today. So yes, um, I'm going to speak to you about my book, Bordering Britain, and in doing so, I'm going to address how race science was at the core of British colonial rule and how the contemporary British border is a legal fiction, but one with, of course, very real and violent effects. So the border was invented to erase from memory how Britain came to be one of the richest places in the world and to justify its exclusion of those from whom it stole and subjugated. So what follows is a retelling of Britain's history, one which challenges mythological narratives and hopefully allows for some new imaginings for its future. So although law announces itself as a rational and neutral set of measures, it is necessarily based on fiction. What differentiates the violence enacted by law from the violence enacted outside of law is the notion that the enforcement of law is legitimate because it derives from sovereign power. Though proclaiming itself to be a secular state, the sovereign is understood as being of a higher order than those subject to its power. All of this is fantasy, but one that is given form and substance through custom, institutions, legislation and systems of government. The fantasy on which British and more widely European sovereignty is based is a particular kind of fantasy, a white Christian supremacist fantasy that drove heady white men in particular to traverse oceans and lands to conquer peoples, enslave them, massacre them, and steal their lands and resources, enriching themselves, their families, and descendants to come. British imperial administrations depended on exploitation of hierarchies based on supposed differences between categories of people. The use of race as an ordering principle played an important part in enabling and justifying colonialism. In order for colonists to conquer entire civilizations, they needed to be known and filed under terms familiar to the colonizer. Anglo-European scholars of the 1800s and 1900s provided the impetus for colonization in their repeated intellectual reductions of entire non-Anglo-European civilizations as readable, translatable, and ultimately understandable as inferior to Western civilization, and therefore eminently conquerable. By contrast, non-Western scholarship until this day remains posited as an inferior generator of culture and knowledge. Prime among criteria for knowing and ordering civilizations in the colonial era was race, which was invoked as an organizational category. The production and signification of the racial in post-Enlightenment era writing depended on the use of tools from science and history, 
This makes it especially important to ask, as Denise Ferreira da Silva does, how racial subjects are created in order to avoid the reproduction of racial others as already differentially constituted historical beings prior to their entrance into the modern political space where they then become subaltern subjects. Race became an ordering principle at a time when imperial formations were competing with nation states for dominance. There was a fixation in the Enlightenment period with categorization and classification of establishing what is inside and what is outside. On the question of who constitutes humanity, this could only be ascertained by determining what lies outside of the human. To this end, the context of European colonialism meant that understandings of humanity were based on a distinction between white Europeans and non-Europeans. The justification of European colonization on the basis of white supremacy was thus not predetermined, but the result of theorizations of fixed racial difference, along with the honing of enlightenment methodologies of categorization and differentiation. The violence of colonialism is, needless to say, not purely semantic. An extreme level of physical threat, force and brutality was administered to maintain the British Empire. Colonizers have always been aware that despite their claim to have founded a durable order, that that order rested on, re on a reversible relation of forces. The possibility for the reversal of colonialism through the actions of resistance movements required extreme violence and its constant threat against subjugated populations. At the same time, dismissals and brutal crackdowns of struggles for self-determination in the colonies necessitated justifications that rested on constructions of difference and their accentuation in official discourse. The tendency in Enlightenment thought to categorize nature and man into types, the exaggeration of what were assumed to be general features, the reduction of innumerable objects to orderable and describable types, was applied with devastating consequences in a colonial context to people. Ideas about racial superiority and inferiority underpinned the division of cultures into civilized and uncivilized and served as normative justifications for colonial conquest. For instance, British colonizers subjugated Aboriginal Australians and Native Americans, constructing them as having failed to socially progress, partly on account of their different relationship to land and thereby justified colonial intervention, land dispossession and rule. Within an Anglo-European understanding of linear time, indigenous people were seen as being primitive and contemptible, inhabiting a bygone era, one which Europeans had transcended. Edward Said thus describes sovereign orders as a monstrous chain of command based on divisions of humanity and progress. For Said, the consequences of dividing humanity into clearly different cultures, histories, traditions, societies, and even races cannot be survived. And there is of course a specificity to the version of white supremacy which underpinned British colonialism. Colonists operated at the height of the expansion of the British empire, propagated the idea that white British people were supreme over all other people, including other white Europeans who were engaged in their own colonial projects. In 1877, for instance, in Confessions of Faith, Cecil Rhodes wrote, it is our duty to seize every opportunity of acquiring more territory, and we should keep this one idea steadily before our eyes, that more territory simply means more of the Anglo-Saxon race, more of the best, the most human, most honorable race the world possesses. Considering that Britain invaded 90% of the current 193 members of the United Nations, it is not difficult to imagine the depth of arrogance and political investment of British colonists in the idea of white British supremacy. So the ideas and practices of racial ordering that I've discussed are constitutive of contemporary British immigration law. By allocating life and death on the basis of whether or not a person meets the criteria for a legal status, and by preventing those who do not from accessing Britain, law is central to ongoing processes of colonial dispossession. Law is the structure which underpins Britain's self-construction as an enclosed space within which resources and wealth obtained via colonial conquest belong to Britons conceived in large part as white. Law's categorization of people into groups, those with and without rights of entry and stay, makes the latter disproportionately at risk of violence and premature death. Immigration law thus falls within Ruth Wilson Gilmore's definition of racism as the state sanctioned and or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. 
The description of racism as structurally produced is helpful for understanding the way in which systems of meaning and control, of which law in one is one, distributes chances at life and death. It allows us to move away from a traditional anti-discrimination um, law framework, which concentrates on locating um, an individual who can be found to have intentionally discriminated, shifting the focus instead onto harmful conditions that are experienced across populations. The effect of law's division of people into groups with differentiated rights is to create hierarchies of people, some of whom have access to territory or basic resources, a chance at survival, whilst others do not. The particular population immigration law targets for abandonment is the racialized poor, the vast majority of whom have personal, ancestral or geographical histories of colonization. For racialized people, the border is neither easily navigable, nor is it temporally and spatially limited. Whiteness as embodied racial power is apparent in the ease with which white people cross borders and move through white hegemonic spaces. White people tend not to be subject to stringent visa requirements and racial profiling, whereas the vast majority of racialized people are unable to purchase tickets for travel or to board planes due to visa rules and carrier sanctions, and are disproportionately stopped and searched at airports. This encounter with the border is a racializing process as a result of which people are made disproportionately vulnerable to harm. People who do not have a right of entry to Britain are forced to undertake treacherous, often fatal journeys. The absence of a right of stay can mean homelessness, lack of access to health care, confinement to a camp or detention center and deportation. People in these conditions are at risk of being subjected to physical and mental violence and death. As the hostile environment policy demonstrates, racialized people also experience internal borders, which are invisible and permeable for most white people. Borders follow people and surround them as they try to access paid labor, welfare benefits, health, protections, education, civil associations, and justice. Sarah Keenan has shown how borders attachment to racialized people means that they take with them the space of the border. In her work on race and time, Keenan describes race as a temporal category to be understood in terms of how long racialized subjects are able to survive in the world. The lives and futures of those without a right of entry and stay are made precarious and contingent. People without a legal status come to occupy, to borrow again from Said, a time that is over. A spatial and temporal understanding of British immigration law enables us to see how it works to place land, resources, healthcare, welfare, security, and opportunities, all of which can be understood as modern day manifestations of stolen colonial possessions out of reach of the vast majority of those with ancestral or geographical histories of colonization. Sarah Ahmed writes, what is reachable is determined precisely by orientations we have already taken. A world that was made white through colonialism as home only for bodies that can inhabit whiteness. Bodies, Ahmed writes, remember histories of colonialism, even when we forget them. Histories of colonialism thus surface on the body. The result is that race becomes a social as well as a bodily given. Colonialism has meant that the vast majority of racialized people have inherited the impossibility of extending the body's reach. They must risk their lives for what the beneficiaries of colonialism take for granted, carrying with them the deadly weight of colonial history, a burden they have inherited. Whilst categorization is important for the creation of meaning, it is the alignment of systems of categorization and the assertion of power that makes racial subjugation possible. It is therefore helpful to understand race, in Alana Lenton's words, as a series of logics and structures that mutually inform and constitute the other. Understanding migration law as a racial regime of power, as part of a colonial edifice, allows us to see the danger of accepting legal categories as givens. While legal categories may be articulated in terms that are race neutral, their effect is to enable the colonial state to administer racial violence. Legal categories such as refugee and citizen legitimize the incarceration, marginalization and expulsion and even death of those who are deemed not to fulfill the criteria required for granting these statuses. The widespread acceptance of legal categories of people moving as defined in international and domestic law thus normalizes the racial violence in which the legal system is implicated. The assumption that legal categories are neutral and fair thus operates to mask the violence they produce and sustain. 
So some unmasking is needed. That is the telling of a more honest history of law and its relationship to colonial violence, one that can help us to challenge the fiction that Britain is a legitimately bordered sovereign nation state. Britain would not be the wealthy, plentiful place that it is without its colonial history. Colonialism and slavery were key to its industrialization and the growth of its capitalist economy. In 1833, Britain abolished slavery only to raise the equivalent of 17 billion pounds in compensation to be paid to British slave owners for the loss of their property. The compensation scheme was the largest um, sponsored payout in British history until it was superseded by the bank bailouts of 2008. The funds paid out built and infused Britain's commercial, cultural, imperial and political institutions. Wealth derived from British slave ownership has by no means been evenly distributed in Britain. It has helped to enrich and sustain elite institutions, individuals and families and has sown inequality deep into the fabric of British society, helping to make it the most unequal place in Europe. Yet Britain's healthcare system, welfare state, transportation infrastructure, cultural and educational institutions, battered and unequally accessible as they are in the wake of privatization and austerity, are colonially derived, along with the private wealth amassed over the course of the British Empire and retained after its defeat via systems of inheritance. To see how Britain came to be understood, not as what it is, the spores of empire, but as a legitimately bordered sovereign nation state, we need to travel back to the 60s, 70s and 80s, which are particularly important decades in the story of immigration law and the making of modern Britain. As colonial populations fought the British from their territories, British lawmakers fast abandoned the myth of imperial unity and equality and moved to introduce controls targeted at racialized colonial subjects and Commonwealth citizens. This legislation culminated in the 1981 British Nationality Act, which raised for the first time the spectre of a post-imperial, territorially defined and circumscribed Britain. It severed a notionally white, geographically distinct Britain from, from the remainder of its colonies and the Commonwealth. Through the concept of patriality, invented for the purposes of the 1971 Immigration Act, whiteness was made intrinsic to British identity. Only patrials, defined as those born in Britain or with a parent born in Britain, had a right of abode and therefore a right of entry and stay in Britain. In 1971, a person born in Britain was 98% likely to be white. The 1981 Act continued this process of racial exclusion by constructing British citizenship on the foundation of the 1971 Act's concept of patriality, tying citizenship to the right of entry and abode. Conservative Home Secretary at the time, William Whitelaw, said of the Act, that it is time to dispose of the lingering notion that Britain is somehow a haven for all those whose countries we used to rule. The move was both materially and symbolically significant. A territorially distinct Britain and a concept of citizenship that made Britishness commensurate with whiteness made it clear that Britain, the landmass and everything within it belongs to Britons conceived intrinsically as white. The 1981 Act did not therefore signify an end to British colonialism, but was itself a colonial maneuver. It was an act of appropriation, a final seizure of the wealth and infrastructure secured through centuries of colonial conquest. Understanding Britain as a contemporary colonial space in this way serves to partially collapse the distinction between settler and non-settler colonial contexts. While it is now an accepted argument in critical scholarship that settler colonialism is ongoing and structural, the same critique has not been applied or accepted to the same extent to non-settler forms of colonialism, which are considered to have ended. Yet the border drawn around the spoils of British colonial conquest via immigration and nationality law amounts to an unredressed act of colonial theft. Due to mainstream understandings of property as being fixed and immovable in space and time, Theft via the passing of immigration co controls can be difficult to conceptualize. Along with the resources and labor stolen in the course of colonialism, the social and cultural networks and relationships that were annihilated or radically reformulated as a result of colonial conquest were also material losses. Colonial dispossession not only determined the contemporary distribution of material wealth, but also radically altered subjectivity in the sense of what people desire consider themselves as entitled to and understand themselves to be. 
theft of intangibles such as economic growth and prospects, opportunities, life chances, psyches and futures occur in all colonial contexts, settler or otherwise. The effect of the 1981 Act, along with changes to immigration law, was to put the wealth of Britain gained by colonial conquest out of reach for the vast majority of people racialized through colonial processes, most of whom with geographical or ancestral histories of British colonialism. Immigration law not only serves as the means of obstruction of movement, it is also the means through which legal status is granted. While critiques of recognition are well established in settler colonial studies, again, these critiques are not as well formulated in relation to Britain. Regimes of legal status um, recognition whereby British authorities determine entitlement to statuses such as citizenship, settlement or indefinite leave to remain or refugee status serve to legitimize the claim that colonial wealth as it manifests in Britain belongs behind its borders only to be accessed with permission. Similar to the way in which indigenous people in Canada and Australia must submit to the rules and evidentiary standards of those colonial legal systems in order to be recognized as having enforceable rights to land, those with ancestral geographical and personal histories of British colonialism who wish to access stolen colonial wealth and resources in Britain must submit to the rules and evidentiary standards of British immigration law. In this way, a fiction of racial inclusion has been written in the form of paths to legal status recognition which dole out immigration statuses to select racialized people who can fulfill certain criteria. Such recognition is always on the terms of the colonial state. Meanwhile, the vast majority of racialized people are prevented from accessing Britain and its wealth in part through the operation of internal and external borders produced and enforced through law. The bestowal or extension of British subjecthood or citizenship in its current guise can thus never be anything other than a colonial act. In the colonial era, British subjecthood was held up as a superior category from which the civilizing benefits of British rule flowed. Yet British colonialism was genocide, mass murder, slavery, dispossession of land, exploitation of labor, and theft of resources, all predicated on white British supremacy. Even so-called free racialized British subjects seeking to move to different parts of the British empire were met with racist immigration laws in places such as Canada and Australia. British subjecthood, did not therefore protect racialized people, racialized subjects from violence of white British supremacy. Its very existence as a legal category was a manifestation of that violence. Whenever it has suited the British government, it has treated its subject as aliens for legal purposes, evicting them from the scope of legal status and protection with devastating consequences. The effect of the hostile environment policy, for instance, was to deny many of the Windrush generation and their children access to healthcare, housing, employment, and other vital services, and to detain and expel them. The traditional acceptance of legal categories as defined in international and domestic law serves to conceal law's role in producing racialized subjects and racial violence. It further impedes an understanding of law as racial violence. Take, for example, the category of the refugee, relatively valorized as compared with the irregularized migrant. Individuals falling outside the legal definition of a refugee are often described as illegal, irregular, or economic migrants and are at risk of removal, denied access to healthcare, housing, and work. A decision to deny legal status carries serious, sometimes fatal consequences. Addressing the historical contingency and artificiality of legal categories, the violence in their production and ongoing material effects allows us to understand how Britain remains colonially and racially configured. It also helps to mitigate against the liberal politics of recognition and hopefully opens the way for development of a more emancipatory and reparative discourse and strategy for migrant solidarity and racial justice. Legal status does not alter the way in which racialized people are cast in white spaces as undeserving guests, outsiders or intruders as here today, but always potentially gone tomorrow. Immigration law is, after all, the prop used to teach white British subjects that what Britain plundered from its colonies is theirs and theirs alone. Immigration law is not, therefore, the seemingly harsh but fair mode through which the deserving are separated from the undeserving. Instead, it is a crucial mechanism for ensuring that colonial wealth remains out of the hands of those from whom it was stolen. Racialized people in Britain, whether categorized as citizens, migrants, refugees, or asylum seekers, are habitually understood as having come from somewhere else. 
Britain's post-colonial articulation of its borders and national identity as, has driven the assumption that anyone who is not white could not be from Britain. Manifestations of this assumption are heard daily across Britain, whether in the form of the subtly disguised racist question, where do you come from originally, or the avowed racist slur, go back to where you came from. In 2013, Theresa May's Home Office plastered the decree, go home or face arrest, on vans commissioned to drive around London in areas where racialized people live. Leave, which became the designation for the campaign for Britain's withdrawal from the European Union, began to take on a double meaning, embodying the go home dictum as a rejection of anyone deemed to be a migrant. Meanwhile, people considered not to have a legal right to remain in Britain are expelled to places that are not home. The legal system thus enacts the go-home decree, the deportation flights carried forward by the justification that people without legal status do not belong in Britain. While racism drives these utterances and enactments, they are also propelled by something else, the idea that Britain is somewhere and not everywhere. Post-colonial critique offers the possibility for a counter pedagogy to that of law. Immigration law's lesson is one of differentiation in human worth and the crystallization of racial hierarchies through legal categorization. For the colonial British state to function, it has always depended on Britons, 87% of whom are white, to imbibe a sense of entitlement and superiority over racialized people. Immigration, refugee and citizenship law regimes in their legitimization of differentiated access to resources according to immigration status convey the lesson that, British, that the British national project is one of white ownership of colonial spoils, a project which is under constant threat from people who do not belong in Britain. A post-colonial critique of immigration law which understands it as ongoing colonial violence disrupts law's pedagogical role, forcing an analysis of contemporary movement that accounts for colonial histories and legacies. So what might be some of the contents of a counter pedagogy to that of law? So-called host states should be understood as colonial spaces and a regularized movement as anti-colonial resistance. By calling for a reconceptualization of a regularized migration as anti-colonial resistance, I'm not relying on a reformist strategy which would require nation states or international organizations or rather depend on them to introduce measures which might facilitate a more redistributive migration regime. Although limited redistribution does occur as a result of immigration, for instance, via the practice of sending remittances and the physical redirection of resources towards migrants present in Britain, the facilitation of migration in and of itself does little to contest broader ongoing colonial violence. Remittances, for instance, do little in the way of building the autonomy or infrastructure of former colonies. Nor am I proposing irregular migration as a practical strategy for resisting ongoing colonial violence in the form of immigration and border controls. But this again is not to deny that irregularized migration can be seen as embodying a practice of resistance in contesting the border and forcing a redistributive element into the relationship between Britain and its former colonies, an element otherwise refused any formal acknowledgement. Indeed, it is precisely the irregularity, the illegality of the relationship that gives irregularized migration its radical anti-colonial reparative and redistributive dimension. In being illegal, it amounts to a forcible return of something that was stolen in a context in which the laws being breached, immigration and border controls, are designed specifically to obstruct such an outcome. Nevertheless, irregularized people are made vulnerable to extreme conditions of racial terror, both in their journeys and attempts to cross borders, as well as in their efforts to navigate legal status recognition processes and hostile environments pre and post arrival. Rather, the reconceptualization I offer of irregularized migration as anti-colonial resistance is intended as an insistence on a recognition that the mainstream and accepted story of Britain's making is fiction. This story serves to justify the violence and injustice of Britain's contemporary border regime. Rather than being seen as rightfully at the mercy of legal status recognition processes, racialized people must be both understood and understand themselves as being collectively entitled to reclamation of wealth accumulated by a colonial dispossession. There is an urgent need for a politics of migrant solidarity and racial justice in colonial contexts, which resists that of state recognition. Such a politics, in the words of Bell Hooks, would require that we stop being so preoccupied with looking to that other for recognition, 
Instead, we should be recognizing ourselves and then seeking to make contact with all those who would engage us in a constructive manner. As scholars and activists, we must acknowledge the connections between historical and ongoing racial projects of capitalist accumulation and contemporary migratory movements and question former colonial powers claims to legitimate and defensible sovereign borders policed and reproduced through immigration, asylum and nationality law. Much legal scholarship is implicated in propagating an ahistorical discourse which fails to address the role of immigration and refugee law concepts in sustaining the structures and concurrent discourse which enable and legitimize conditions of racial violence. We must work towards a language that refuses terms such as host states, refugee producing states, irregular or illegal economic migrants. Understanding how Britain came to be one of the wealthiest places in the world and how immigration law is deployed to exclude from its national project those at whose expense Britain was built is an important step towards formulating internationalist, anti-imperialist racial justice strategies. Colonial subjects dispossessed of resources and then of access to Britain were intrinsic to its making. As George Orwell wrote in 1939, the overwhelming bulk of the British proletariat does not live in Britain, but in Asia and Africa. He described the British Empire as nothing but a mechanism for exploiting cheap colored labor. Aditya Mukherjee has shown how at the heart of colonialism lay surplus appropriation from the colony to the metropolis. In the case of India, unrequited transfers whereby the colony paid for the export of its own products to Britain served as a massive and protracted drain on the Indian economy while simultaneously contributing to Britain's economic sustenance and growth. The fact that colonized populations grew and sustained the British economy is juxtaposed with the habitual official denial that Britain owes anything to those enslaved and colonized. This erasure manifests in part through the refusal to engage in processes which would see Britain pay reparations to colonized nations. In 2015, then Prime Minister David Cameron on a visit to Jamaica refused to apologize or engage on the question of payment of reparations for Britain's role in transatlantic slavery, preferring instead to move on from this painful legacy and continue to build for the future. The future building Cameron was particularly interested in was the 25 million British aid funded prison to which people with Jamaican nationality convicted of criminal offenses in Britain could be sent to serve out their sentences. Although this project was not implemented, Britain has contributed such prison building projects in Nigeria, another of its former colonies. The presence in Britain of racialized people from countries with histories of, co of colonialism has the effect of challenging and troubling white supremacist structures. Sarah Keenan has noted the way in which significant political potential can come when particular bodies that do not belong according to dominant networks of belonging nonetheless remain in that place. This troubling occurs in part through the taking up of physical space but also in serving as a defiant reminder of Britain's colonial identity and the origins of its wealth. The arrival of the historically dispossessed in what was the heart of the British Empire has the effect of troubling racialized depictions of colonized populations as backward and uncivilized. Migration thus poses a challenge to colonial assertions of the stunted development and progress of colonized places and their populations, assertions which served as justifications for colonial rule. Colonialism meant that different places were interpreted as being at different stages in a single temporal development. As Doreen Massey wrote in this schema, Europe is constructed as advanced while other parts of the world are presented as some way behind and yet others are backward. In this way, places come to be denied their coeval existence. Massey thus argued that the arrival in Britain of people constructed as being from the past in British imperial narratives meant that distance was suddenly eradicated, both spatially and temporally. Migration was thereby an assertion of coevals. In this sense, coevalness is a powerful assertion of presence in the here and now by people colonial processes have relegated to the past. Coevalness as expressed through immigration of racialized people to Britain is thus an imaginative space of engagement. It speaks of an attitude. It is a political act. To conclude, the Imperial Vanishing Act performed by changes to immigration and nationality laws in the 1960s, 70s and 80s cast Britain's imperial history into the shadows. The British Empire, about which most Britons know little, can be remembered fondly as a moment of past glory, as a gift once given to the world. 
The erasure has been so complete that Conservative MP Liam Fox could declare in 2000 and nine, in 2016 that the United Kingdom is one of the few countries in the European Union that does not need to bury its 20th century history. And in 2019, the British government could take umbrage at the European Union's perfectly accurate description of Gibraltar, an illegal document, as a British colony. In announcing itself as post-colonial, Britain cut itself off symbolic, symbolically and physically from its colonies and the Commonwealth taking with it what it had plundered. While Britain may appear to be an island, it is in fact everywhere. The British Empire's legacies of racism, slavery, labor exploitation, land dispossession, bordering and plunder are to this day felt viscerally across the world. It is only with the confinement of British colonialism to the past that its former subjects, whether categorized today as citizens, migrants, refugees or asylum seekers, can be understood to have come from somewhere else. If Britain is acknowledged as being everywhere, its colonial legacy still reaching like tentacles across the world, then Britain is where we are from. In this way, the dictum go home becomes paradoxically, subversively, an invitation to stay. Thank you.